Hi, I'm Vern Anderson. I'm an animal scientist at North Dakota State University. We've had a dry live cow operation at this research center two hours off campus for about 42 years, and we've learned a lot of lessons, and we've done some comparative research uh, with pasture production. We introduced the dry life concept. This is a really interesting synergy with, with crop production. It does require higher levels of management. You have to be responsible for everything that, that that cow has fed in, in health and care. Uh, there is more practical research needed in this area of livestock production. And this is not unique to the Corn Belt. We have had worldwide interest in multiple continents on how to raise cattle in confinement with uh, feed resources, primarily residues and co-products that we have in abundance in this part of the nation. So dry lot beef production uh, is a worldwide project. To define the dry lot production, I think it's important in, in our scenario in this part of the nation that we identify uh, spring calving cows. These are cows that, that we feed normally during the period of time when, uh, when they would be grazing in the pasture. Uh, here we have a, a dry lot concept of May through September. It requires us to feed those cows on a regular basis, probably daily or on alternate days. Uh, we have free feed for the calves. Uh, we do need some more studies in, in creep grazing. Uh, the facility that we have is used uh, uh, pretty hard. It needs to be cared, cared for. Uh, maintenance operations and fencing and water fountains and uh, manure hauling and so forth are, are required on a more regular basis. And so there is some activity during the summer for this type of operation. Uh, the purpose of this is to integrate this with uh, integrate beef production with pasture or cropland. Uh, cropland pastures are a concept that we would like to study a little bit more with current commodity prices. It might be fruitful to at least consider putting some of our cropland or marginal cropland back into grasses that can be a little more productive than our native range. Uh, certainly, if we're using a pure dry lot concept and our cropland remains into crop production. We want to maximize the aftermath grazing, utilize the cover crops. The residue is kind of the bread and butter of our operation. Uh, dedicated forage production is minimal. Uh, in North Dakota, we need some bedding in the wintertime, so uh, that, that cropland provides the bedding as well as the feed for us. One thing that we uh, don't really consider um, uh, in the first uh, shot is that the manure produced by those cows in the summer in the pen has value as fertilizer. It's underappreciated in value. Uh, and the sustainability of, of crop production and utilizing some of the crop byproducts and keeping that phosphorus in our communities and on our farms is absolutely critical. And for long term sustainability, this is an imperative thing that we have animals integrated with crop production in our regions of the country. Our industry dry lot project, as I indicated, has been going on for a number of years. We have 125 spring calving cows. We are using the cross belt system. Uh, we vertically integrate this uh, cow calf operation with feedlot, and that gives us some definite advantages. Uh, the challenges have been in cow nutrition and management, uh, been the focus of our research. Our diets are based on residue. We do have uh, enhanced mineral nutrition where we have had some issues, uh, modest uh, issues with the painful centers and so forth in years past. And after a little more enhanced mineral nutrition with some microminerals, we solved that problem. We have a number of co-products available to us in addition to the residues that we have. And so we, we can balance the cow's ration with a wide variety of feeds. And that's been one of the things that we focused on here at North Dakota is uh, the variation of feeds that we have. It used to be uh, corn, or sorry, it used to be wheat, uh, barley, canola, flax, country. Now it's basically corn and soybeans, like uh, the entire corn belt. And, and so we have relied more heavily on corn store and distillage grains uh, for diets for these cows. Here's an aerial view of the Carrington Research Center. You can see the, the cropland is uh, diverse and some irrigation and some different crops that are uh, grown. Uh, the pens you see are the focus of our dry lot and our feedlot operation. And so uh, we are in a very intensively cropped people region. So the pasture is at a very minimum, it has been for uh, many more years. And so the, the cows and the dry lot pens have access to crop residue and screenings and co-products and, and a wide variety of uh, feed ingredients that we use to balance the ration. 
past few years, we've been doing a comparison with dry lot versus pasture. In this scenario, we have 40 cows in the summer in each group. Uh, they stayed in the same group for years and years and years. Uh, the breeding that we used in this program is a 45-day natural service breeding. We test the bulls before we start the breeding season. We ended up, after a number of years, with the same conception rate of 86% uh, in each group, which isn't anything to write home about. And our pasture cows and our dry cows came in at about the same uh, pregnancy rate, so uh, we don't have any differences there. The management differences are substantial, though. Uh, weaning, uh, the dry lot calves were weaned in mid to late September, and the pasture calves went to a more traditional uh, very late October or very early November. And so we have some, some issues in how we measure uh, weight gain. Uh, on the same day in the fall, whether it's late September or late October, we weighed the calves and, and there was a 40 pound advantage uh, for the pasture calves, which is uh, uh, substantial. And in this scenario, we provided creep feed to both groups of calves. Uh, there was some year to year variability, some years it was uh, much less than 40 pounds, and some years it was a little bit more. So uh, there are some things that we think we can do to reduce that 40 pound difference. Uh, it is interesting to note that we put those calves in the feedlot and we pushed them hard. And by the time they got to market, uh, the following May, they weighed the same on the same day. So that vertical integration uh, removed any difference in the dry lot production. A little bit on the economics. And bear in mind that this is data from a few years ago, so the numbers may not be completely accurate with what you would experience today, but the relative numbers, of, the relativity of the numbers, I think, uh, is indicative of, of what we see here. The ration for dry lot cost, cows cost $1.72 a day, heavily residue based and co-product based, and some of the co-products we used were discounted in the summer because there is not a good amount of demand. Pasture cost and, and the pasture rents were $25 an acre for six months. Uh, right now, pasture rents are considered a bit higher than that, so the cows cost about a dollar a day uh, in the pasture. We did credit the dry lot cows for about $65 uh, volume for manure during the entire summer. We captured that and, and uh, held that for fertilizer. So uh, what can we do to make a difference to improve the cost basis? Uh, we need to wean the dry lot cows as early as possible. And weaning is a very simple uh, process. We remove the cow from the pen and the calf stays there, eats out of the same bunk, drinks out of the same water company. Uh, we have tried uh, alternate day feeding. With some success, it needs to be researched in much more detail, uh, where the concentrate is provided on an alternate day basis in a bunk, reducing the labor, reducing the machinery costs, uh, and self feeding the forages and residue within the course of the, the time those cows are above in the pen. Uh, the cost per pound of wean calf, and this is a partial budget, so again, it's a relative thing, it's not the total budget, it does not include the winter costs and so forth. This is simply a uh, reflection of the difference in the in the pasture cost and the dry lot cost in the pounds of calf wean. So we see about a uh, 23, 23 cents difference per pound, uh, and that's substantial. And we need to work on uh, reducing that. So our lessons we've learned in this are uh, we do like cow that is a relative resistance cow. In some cases, we have selected for too much milk production. And that gets to be a problem in the spring. Uh, we'd rather have a calf that we can feed maybe in the feedlot. To grow, then we have to produce milk to feed that calf in the summer with an expensive lactation ration. We do like British cross cattle. We are using Red Angus, Red Simmental cross, as you see in the picture there. Uh, cows are a good temperament. We have had some uh, rather aggressive cows that, that didn't seem to want to stay in the pen. Uh, some breeds have more aggressive nature than other breeds, and so we'll pick your breeds accordingly. Uh, modest size, cross breeding, uh, they're kind of a given, I believe, in a, in a dry lot scenario. Uh, nutrition is the big, biggest challenge from our experience. Meeting the nutrient requirements is imperative. Uh, in some cases, we have sorted cows to specific needs of the group. You can sort off old cows, you can sort off young cows, you can sort off light cows, and, and the easy question ones when you put them in the group, depending on the pens you have available. You can do all the good book work and do all the ration balancing, but keep an eye on the cow. The, the, the condition of the cow is key. So that cow needs to be fed to be gaining weight during the uh, breeding period. And, uh, and that's our challenge is to uh, put the right ingredients in that, in that uh, boat. Uh, Pre-calving through breeding is a critical time. 
and a thousand would be gaining weight, and we have had success with that at an 85% per service uh, conception and a number of twins in the process. So we are relatively pleased with uh, how that has gone, even if we've only uh, had 86% total conception uh, at the end of the day. Corn stover and distiller's grains have been our base feeds, so we have a variety of other feeds uh, to consider. When we look at corn stover, we would really like to separate corn stover into the better parts or the more nutritious parts, the wheat and the husk and the upper part of the stock. Separate that from the lower part of the stock, and if there's a way to do that in the field, uh, we haven't discovered that yet, but I think that's another area that we need a little more research. Health management has not been a significant problem for us. Uh, the cattle are in the pen, they're easy to get at. If you need to treat something, they're right there to treat, whether you need to vaccinate or treat the group in mass. And I think we've only had to do that once with a serious respiratory outbreak. Uh, but that is not necessarily a dry lot scenario that was early in the spring during uh, spring snow and rain and blizzards and cold and wet. You can watch those cattle daily and as you should, you can respond rapidly to any kind of a problem, whether it's scours, we've had a couple of dust pneumonias, we've had an odd foot problem, occasionally we've had an injury, something gets stepped on, but it's not a frequent problem. Uh, we have not had uh, any major crisis issues uh, during the course of this uh, 42 years. Of Calf management, a little bit of an issue there we need to work on. Uh, we talk about creep feed and we use a relatively modest energy creep feed with a little bit higher fiber in it. We put in soy hulls and wheat nodes and other ingredients that are not as nutrient dense as what we might if you were the creep raising uh, calves on a pasture. We have used a number of additives such as yeast in some of those diets and study those and those do have some value. Creep raising calves, I think, is an area that really needs a little extra work. We had done this um, several years ago in a small scale, a few replications, and, and it did give us a, an advantage in lean weight and it decreased our feed intake. A little small paddock of grass with a hole in the fence where the cows can get through, but the cows cannot the creek gate. Uh, there is more research in, needed in this area, but it does give the calves an opportunity to get away from the dust and the mud and the flies and the crowding and get out into the green grass and kick up their heels. And they responded by gaining uh, more weight. Uh, and less creep feed, so that was an economic advantage. Weaning early at 100 to 150 days uh, is a recommendation. Certainly that takes a little care for the calves, and, and I think any good cattleman would be capable of a balancing a ration for young calves that would be palatable and, and nutrient dense. And I believe it's cheaper to feed that calf to gain than feed the cow to produce milk to feed the calf plus feed the creep feed. So there are some advantages in uh, economics and, and not feeding up cow any longer than you have to. Uh, on the breeding side of the things, in, in the dry lot, it's easier to synchronize in the eye. You go and sit on the fence post and you can see the entire group of cows. You heat check, you're right close to the chute. It's easy to move the cows around or they're comfortable moving through that, that uh, working chute system on a regular basis. In the dry lot, we extended the use of our bulls. We typically will feed cows, uh, 40 to 50 cows to the churn bowl uh, and uh, have a lot of uh, uh, proximity, uh, close contact with the other cows and the cows line up at the bunk in the morning, the bull will get on and check every cow and uh, take care of the chores if he needs to, so it's kind of an interesting uh, way to make better use of uh, a good mature bull who has the breeding potential. Flight control is a problem that we have uh, addressed and I think we have successfully uh, managed this. There are a number of options for fly control, uh, certainly premise spray or spray the animals with fly tags or pour on. We have looked at oral larvicides, and if there are other cattle in the region that are not getting oral larvicides, that's a useless effort. It costs too much. We have not studied wasps, but we do have a uh, good pen drainage system, and we aggressively clean the pens, and so manure is uh, moved around, and, and the fly problems can be. Uh, mediated to a great extent by managing the surface of the pens and keeping it relatively clean and piling manure all without an opportunity. Uh, I mentioned that the value of the manure is, is, is uh, 50 to 60, maybe $65 per cow. Certainly, if you put bedding in there, the, the, you add the carbon mix and that makes a better carbon to nitrogen ratio to uh, capture that manure and sequester the nitrogen in there rather than have it volatilize and we have data to support that. Uh, the regular box scraping and removal certainly is an advantage for not only flies, but we use in order 
and keeping uh, mud from accumulating in the low-lying areas. We do compost the manure, it reduces the volume and hauling cost, it stabilizes the nutrients in the fertilizer. We use that on our cropping system and it does improve the performance of the crops and yields compared to some of the chemical fertilizers and we're very fond of manure and the organic matter and the micronutrients that it provides for the crops. So uh, on your own crops so or on the market value, I think there's some potential for uh, adding value to the entire power operation with uh, composted manure. In conclusion, I think uh, I'd like to suggest this is a flexible option. Uh, certainly not a finite, uh, absolute uh, program. You can put your own cows in there that are not able to eat grass. You can use it for young cows in the AI. It does take a little logistics planning for uh, the feed and the labor and the effort and the management to take care of these cows. But that whole management thing is critical here, far more critical than cows on pasture. Uh, people with livestock knowledge and the passion to keep track of the cows, somebody with nutritional ability uh, to come in and balance the ration with a wide variety of feeds. And, and you, know, you can use uh, uh, different feeds different times of the year with nutrient densities and mix and match. Our experience is that the cows will eat a wide variety of feeds as long as it's balanced to meet their needs will do quite nicely. Uh, Time with health care, if you have an infection at some time and it gets into the group, uh, you need to stand up in a hurry or you're going to have your entire group uh, get sick, but we have uh, the ability to take care of these problems in short order because they're close and you see them relatively uh, readily. So maintain the facility, uh, important for both fencing, water, all the other aspects. We have written a circular that's a couple of years old on dry lot, gives you some more thoughts on uh, small areas of land that can be used to grow crops, uh, rental facilities, cow shares, and, and a number of things. So, I encourage you to look that up on, on the website. Thank you. Um, my uh, phone number and email address is listed below. Uh, I am partially retired, but I will be open to your calls, and I do take dry lot calls from producers on a regular basis, and, and look forward to your questions if you would have any. Thank you.